Good morning, everyone. Never thought I'd be one of these people standing up with a jacket and jeans. Aren't those sort of CEOs that wear the suit jackets and the jeans to try and look cool? It's a bit creepy, isn't it, when they do that? But um, it's not a suit jacket, which I think looks terrible, the way Bulma wears it with the black shoes to try and look like he works for Apple. It's, it's horrible. Um, so this is about as cool as I get, I'm afraid. I'm from old school media, and I'm going to explain to you why I still think it's relevant and what we do is important. But I want to talk about user engagement today. That is the link to the intersection bit of the blurb at the top of your um, invitation. Um, answer the question I was always told. I'm old school like that as well. So let's start at the beginning. Um, most academics now agree that unlike Frank Sinatra's When I Was 17 or Jung's Theory of Intermediation, one's life is actually determined by uh, newspapers. Um, you pee into them and chew them when you're very little and you're announced in them. You, um, get, you read the comics, you cram with them when you go through university. Uh, your death is announced in them at the end. You sleep under them like my father does. But sociologists now agree that the pivotal point in your life, moving from young to old, is the first time you write into a newspaper. That is the moment where you are declared old. How many of you, and I'm not talking about comments, have written or emailed to an old-style newspaper? Theory is absolutely bang on. <laughs> That's why it is important. User engagement is important. And user engagement has always been important to newspapers. And in a quite a modern context as well, um, in the 1700s in the US, up in New England, the Jeffersons and Hamiltons, the founding fathers of these worlds, would regularly write to New England papers under pseudonyms. They wouldn't even write under their own names. People would write in, opposite views would come into the newspaper. Newspapers always understood the value of reader comment. We have always understood that. Um, but there were very few ways you could actually interact with a newspaper. You could only really write in. Um, today, you might get a column in an op-ed um, piece if you are a um, distinguished person. Occasionally, we would allow sort of funny notes or funny letters to come into the newspaper, or you'd get the, the ranting letter, and we still get ranting letters, and we enjoy putting those in the paper as well. But the avenues of engagement with newspapers was fairly narrow. That has all changed. Newspapers and the media, the news media in particular, are obsessed with what you think. Write in, what do you think, contact us, have your say, all the rest of it. It has exploded in the last, well, under 10 years, actually. Um, it's a relatively recent phenomenon. It actually started by the... Um, the Colorado newspaper, in as recently as 2006, they said you can write into the restaurant section or write into our film section. 2007, the Washington Post started to allow comments, but only on the sports section. Um, 2008, the Wall Street, um, the New York Times allowed a few comments. Uh, the Guardian in the UK, 2006. It's not, you know, it's a relatively recent idea of allowing people to post comments directly under news stories. Of course, it's been around in radio for a long time. Um, the BBC from 1968 had um, talk shows and phone-in programs. Other media, um, like TVs with Vox Pops, have done it um, for a long time, but newspapers were quite slow to this idea, whether it was journalists trying to protect their patch or feeling high and mighty or whatever, um, but it's relatively recent. Now, we know what's causing it, of course. Um, it is the rise of the internet, changing technology. And you can see from this slide that um, this was a questionnaire that the Pew Institute um, does regularly in the US, and I use that because it's got the longest data I can find, and it asks this question on the right every year. It asks Americans where do they get their news from. You can see that TV is slowly trending downwards. You can see that people get fewer and fewer news from newspapers, but that occurred a long time before um, the advent of the internet. And then you can see this relatively recent explosion in internet um, news reading by the public. And indeed, um, for under 30-year-olds, those two lines have crossed. Um, now, in most parts of the world, under 30-year-olds get more news from the internet than they do from the TV. And most people expect that line, those two lines to cross for the rest of us um, in the near future. 
This slide is also um, very painful for us and very difficult to manage in the newspaper business because it's still a fact that ads in newspapers are 10 times more profitable or we generate 10 times the ad revenue from papers as we do from online. Um, they're almost two irreconcilable trends. We know this is going on, but pro papers are still far more profitable than online ads for us. The other trend that's making this easier is the move to mobile. Um, mobile is becoming more and more important. I can't believe people want to read newspapers on their phones and on iPads, but they do. It's been very successful for us. This is the FT. You can see now from the blue line that we're getting up to 40-odd percent of people reading on mobile devices. It won't also be surprising to you that they tend to read them on mobile in the mornings, in the evenings when they're commuting, and then they flip to FT.com during the day. That's the sort of rough movement of readership for our paper. So people can now comment from any old place, the toilet, the bus, and they do. Why do they do that? It must be an inherent desire in man, and we all know the types of people we're talking about, but there seems to be a constant number of people on planet Earth that want to tell you something, and they want everybody else to know it as well. And companies like Twitter survive, of course, because there are a fixed number of humans that think that the entire world is really interested in what they've got to say about a whole bunch of topics. So this rise of user engagement is not a change in demand. I'm going to assume, as far as I'm concerned, that demand is fairly constant with this very scientific and rigorous chart. So we know that it's the supply side, and we've caused this to happen. We control the web. We're allowed to do whatever we want. We have asked you to comment. And here's a typical BBC website. I mean, just look at it. They're asking for your view on every little part of this site. In the small print, in the big print, have your say here, write into us, what do you think, blah, blah, blah. We have asked for this change to happen. And indeed, it's become embedded in so many websites. Here's the Guardian website, and you can see that before they even link stories to the main headlines, they're boasting about the comments underneath each story, as if to say, please read this story, it's got more comments. There's 1,600 experts on what's happening in Boston right there for you. But I put up this slide to show you that we are now promoting comments as an important part of the news agenda for our readers. Here is CNN and said, well, you know, grab yourself a camera, send, go out, do a few interviews, send it in. We can actually cut costs. It's a really good idea. Why don't you do our reporting for us? So it's gone to an extreme in some cases. Now, and this is the, the nub of my speech, this has led to editors saying, why don't the journalists start commenting back? Why don't you get involved in the conversation? We have thousands and millions of people writing in. Why don't we get involved? Let's get a discussion going here. And this happens in a couple of ways. Um, the most common one is to embed your um, comments into comment chains. Um, we have message boards that we get involved with, blogs in particular. And in the FT, at least, we have armies of people sending tweets out. They're called tweets, right? Um, tweets out to um, readers. Um, our markets editor, for example, um, racks up about 20 of these an hour. There are various ways now we are told to do it. We have been told by our editor to get more involved. I know in the, um, there was a review of American journalists. Um, 2,000 journalists were interviewed. About 50% of them now in the US say they um, contact readers in some form or, or another, email or in the comment section or whatever. And about 20% of them, a lower number, say they um, contact readers about their own article. And that, that proportion is growing fairly quickly. Why have we been forced um, to start communicating with our readers? Obviously, and rarely, I would add, um, our bosses are actually thinking commercially, and they believe that this will um, help our bottom line. If you run a subscription model like we do at the FT, um, like The Economist does, the idea is obviously to promote loyalty, to attract people to subscribe, um, to stop people from canceling their subscription, and there's an idea that if you build community and some loyalty and some fun into the interaction, that readers will stay engaged. If you have an advertising model, however, and as I showed you on that previous slide, or I told you, 
advertising is still by far the most important revenue stream for most of our newspapers. It's simply about eyeballs. It's getting people onto the site so our commercial department can go to advertising companies and say, please, can we charge X? Now, both of these um, reasons are unproven. i let you know at this point. And, but they, that is the logic behind both of these trends. Now, to my mind, there are three risks. Up until this point, this is, everyone believes this across the newspaper industry. Everyone believes this is the right way to go. I personally believe that there are three huge risks here. The first is brand dilution. This manifests itself in a few ways. Firstly, it's the big problem that lots of comments are frankly awful, rude, racist, bigoted. Um, the New York Times was absolutely shocked when it first allowed comments on. They couldn't believe it. They actually took it down for a short while. Um, you, many, many of you may have seen the comments during the Boston um, crisis uh, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, the, the comments that went up there in the first couple of hours were extraordinary. Is there a link between our readers reading these comments and their feeling towards us as a newspaper or us as a new, news organization? This hasn't been tested. Then there's the idea that what do readers think when they see a whole bunch of worthwhile comments next to our journalists' article? Is the journalism being degraded. Do people begin to think less highly of a journalist if they see a fantastic comment underneath that makes a mockery of their story? Perhaps the idea and the reverence that the journalist is being held is being degraded. Then there's that time and the effort. The Huffington Post has 30 full-time comment moderators working 24 hours a day, reading 100 comments per hour each an extraordinary amount of resources. We at the FT, who are as Luddite as you could imagine, we have now got a team of five, and many people are spending a proportion of their day dealing with this stuff. It takes time, it chews up time. And the final point is the one of mystique. The more you contact people, the more you interact with them, the less mysterious you are, the less people want to hear you. This is a very important concept. This is, for those of you who do economics, scarcity value. This, I think, is totally underplayed and very underexplored. The second point I would make is that very few people are actually commenting. You've heard of the 99-1 rule in social communities. 90% of comment, people just read them. 9% participate a bit. Most of them come from 1% um, of, the, of the readers. It's actually worse than this. The Guardian let slip once that it has 600,000 comments a month. 2,600 of those comments come from 40 people. Back of an envelope calculation, they have 70 million readers a month. So comment represents under 1% of all people participating in the Guardian website. We assume that everybody loves this, but there's a gigantic number of people out there who have nothing to do with the comment arena at all, and maybe being annoyed with people commenting. The third point is that sometimes I'm sure people think, why do they let these comments on? Here is, it some, here is the CNN asking for comment on, acquaintances wonder whether one bra brother brainwashed the other. Who, will, who possibly knows? One's lying in hospital, the other's dead. Why will somebody sitting in Omaha know anything about whether one brother brainwashed the other. You just don't know. They ask these questions for comments all the time. Do you think the trajectory of the moon landing rocket at 33 degrees is going to... I don't know. No one knows. You should ask a rocket scientist. No. 20,000 comments under that one. I think this is a, this is a problem. The, the third problem I would raise is just one of volume. This is the incredible Huffington Post now receives 70 million comments a year. They just can't get through them. And the problem for even people who are interested in commentary is you can no longer find the comments that you're interested in. Lex is different. There are parts of people who still believe that we're going to tell you what you think. We have no interest in what you think in return. We're smarter than you. We do more analysis than you. We, we are above the chatter. We're above the noise. Everyone else is wrong, and we are right. Now, we don't necessarily have to believe this, but if we can 
give you this impression and keep this as our philosophy, I believe that one of the reasons why Lexus survived 80 years is this authoritative feel to the column makes people want to read it. Martin Wolf, our economist, has no interest in what you guys have to think. I asked him once whether he has a Twitter account. He said, certainly not. <laughs> David Bowie's never cared about what anyone thinks. Warren Buffett doesn't care what any of you think. A lot of companies that have been very successful, and I would pull some of these out here, McKinsey business model hasn't changed in 100 years. Do they care what the public think? No. They charge a lot of money to keep their IC secret and to a selective number of people. Content is the important thing. Content is king. There was a very, there's another study done of um, about 10,000 readers, and the hypothesis was that people read articles when they have a personal involvement, when they are interested in it. It actually showed that they're interested in novelty, content, interest, analysis. There is still a demand out there for these traditional things, and they never go away. Other things come and go, content doesn't. And the final philosophical and political point, it may be the case, and people have shown this in studies, that deliberation helps the democrat democratic process. Citizenry involvement in discussion does lead to good outcomes. It does lead to good involvement and an aware public. But it doesn't mean that it is a good business model for newspapers, nor does it mean it's a good business model or a good model for yourself. Don't forget the importance of scarcity value. Don't forget the importance of the fundamentals in journalism. And I rest my case.